Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed we do. Hope everybody had a fantastic weekend. We've got Zed Jelani on to talk about whether the federal government can ever do anything properly Andrew. ever again. <laughs> yeah. We have Andrew Romanoff on. He's a progressive challenger in the Democratic primary for Senate in Colorado, who has been gaining quickly on John Hickenlooper, who was sort of the Democratic establishment anointed corporatist candidate who's facing a corruption scandal. So be great to talk to Andrew today. Uh, but we wanted to start with some of the polling numbers, new stuff that's out this morning. Yeah, the polling has been basically catastrophic for the Trump campaign. This is from the Real Clear Politics average of the last five major national polls that have come out there. You can see that the average is 9.5 is Biden's lead. But if you dig down deeper, it's 12. Biden's uh, Trump's best poll of the week only had Biden plus eight in the Quinnipiac poll. Biden plus nine in Economist YouGov, plus 10 in CNBC, and plus 14 in that you know infamous, I guess, CNN poll. So everybody seems to have Trump down by a minimum of eight points and an average of 9.5. And I think the really important thing to remember here is that even if the polls were off this time around, as much as they were in 2016, it would not matter. Is that even out within that margin of error, if you include that plus the margin of error, Biden is still up. And especially in the key demographic of American seniors who seem to have just switched. I mean, even in the best poll, the Quinnipiac poll, the crosstabs there show that Biden is up by nine points amongst American seniors. That is just not sustainable in a, in a place like Florida, which is a must-win state for President Trump and for many of the other ones that he needs to carry, it's just, and Arizona as well. Yeah, and by the way, not even reflected in that RCP average is a new Reuters Ipsos poll that has Biden up 13. Oh, so it may well push that okay, average up over 10 points. Yeah. And remember when the CNN poll came out and we covered it as like, this is an outlier, but it's something noteworthy. The Trump campaign freaked out. They created this whole memo about right. why the poll was fake. And look, it still is at the high end of what people are seeing, but it is actually not out of line with the general totality of where right. the average is nationally. And if you dig down into the battleground states, Biden is leading in almost every one, including ones that, you know, frankly, he doesn't really need to win, like North Carolina or Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the interesting thing here, too, is in that new Reuters Ipsos poll, it's quite clear why Trump has slid. It's not just that, you know, it's not just that Trump has slid. Biden has also gained and is approaching that 50 point mark, which right. is, you know, another troubling sign where Hillary Clinton never made it to. But Trump's approval rating is at a seven month low. Yes. And he's lost ground even with his own Republican base, mm -hmm. where again in that Reuters Ipsos poll, every single month he has lost ground with Republicans. So this is really a widespread phenomenon having to do with his handling of coronavirus, having to do with his handling of the George Floyd protests. Of course, the rally over the weekend, which was an utter debacle and embarrassment, is not going to help matters. But I think really underscores and I'm going to talk more about this in my radar. Look, last cycle, Trump really controlled every news cycle. Yes. He picked the issues people were going to debate. He picked the controversies that were going to flare up. He even picked the metrics of success, like we're going to make this all about rallies and how many people you can get to rallies, and that's going to be the sign of the enthusiasm outside of the polls. This time around, nothing is in his control, and he's just sort of r unable to ride the news cycle or marshal any sort of a response that gives people any confidence. So the dynamic is totally different, and I don't even know what his case really is for re-election. Yeah, I mean, and well, he he his speech, I mean, his rally, I think, was an hour and 40 minutes, and a lot of it, I'll talk about this a lot in my radar, which is that a lot of it is is defensive and it's not really like a positive framework in the way right. he was talking about in 2016. And you're beginning to see the electorate, frankly, tire of it. We have this, uh, one of this very interesting tidbit from one of the most recent polls that we got here about Trump and Biden voters. And it shows that of Biden voters, only 35% of them say they are voting for Biden, while 62% saying they are voting against Trump. And amongst Trump voters, 81% are saying they are voting for him, only 18% saying they're voting against Biden. A couple of different things there. Just shows you how weak of a candidate Biden actually is, showing that if we weren't in the middle of a Great Depression and all of this domestic turmoil, there's no way that this would have happened. And the structural inequities, which we pointed out, would have absolutely, I believe, led to his defeat. He's only surging as a matter of circumstance and as a matter of the Trump campaign and their mishandling of the moment, not of anything positively that he has done. He's not doing Hence anything. Why so. you stay in the basement <laughs> and do nothing. Um, but also it shows you with the Trump campaign, their problem is, I, I don't have the numbers. 
I bet you that number was higher for Hillary against Hillary. Yeah. That is another important thing. So I saw a very interesting tidbit from reporters who were at the rally in Tulsa over the weekend. They said one of the most interesting parts is that a lot of the T-shirts and all the stuff for, among the camp, uh, among the base still have stuff about Clinton on it. Hmm. And that whenever Trump would go after Biden, that the base was just not as riled up. Yeah. And, I, and I get that. I mean, Biden is somebody who I'm not saying he's a skilled politician, but he is not somebody who is loathed in the way that Hillary Clinton was. And I think that he has skillfully, I mean, not out of any, he didn't intuit this, but he just positioned himself in a way. I mean, the, the reason why the progressive left hates him is why a lot of people are like, OK with him. They're like, oh, you know, he seems like kind of a moderate guy and he's never been, you know, a particular culture warrior or anything, although I think he would empower many of those figures. And he's never had, you know, like a Benghazi or something like that. And with all of these uh, lack of moments for him, there's not the same level of hatred in the American electorate no. for Biden the way there was for Hillary. So that's a two, it's like a dual prong thing there. Yeah. No, I mean, those numbers that you put up about mm -hmm. how few people are actually voting affirmatively for Biden. 30%, one third. It yeah. shows you how pathetic it is to be losing to him by double digits yeah, right now. I mean, you couldn't have drawn, like, yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. He doesn't trigger the visceral loathing that Hillary did. That is yeah. true. And even in the Democratic primary, the, the flashpoints were more like Pete Buttigieg was more more hated. Elizabeth Warren became more hated. And it was only sort of late in the game when it was really down to Bernie versus Biden that people really honed in on what his policy record was and how you had to, because he has created this like very bland middle class Joe kind of brand that if you don't actually look at the record has some appeal in a broad swath of the country and doesn't trigger people with that visceral hatred that a Hillary Clinton did or in the Democratic primary context that like a Pete Buttigieg did. So, yeah, if he's able to just kind of hang out in the basement, not really shake things up, not remind people of why maybe they shouldn't have confidence in him, it's enough. But again, he's not a good candidate. No. Like, he's not an effective candidate. In some ways, Hillary was stronger because she was at least more with it and more articulate and knew what she was pushing for. Um, with him, you know, you, I saw a poll from uh, from Zogby that has a majority of voters think he's in mental decline. Yes, and you're right. losing to him by double digits. There's another piece here that is interesting um, over at Politico. Gabby Orr, a friend of the show, actually mm -hmm. reported out this piece about how Trump is losing some ground with evangelical voters. Um, right. If we can put up the Politico A1C here. Mm -hmm. He's losing some ground. And look, why is this important? Because he had, this was the most solid part of his base. I think 81% of white evangelical Christians yes. went for Donald Trump. And that is one of the areas where we've seen a little bit of erosion in terms of popularity, a little bit of erosion in terms of support. Joe Biden has, you know, this background of faith. He's very, wears it very Catholic. comfortably. Yeah. You know, he's Catholic. That's really informed the way that he talks about politics, the way he talks about his values. And so, look, is Joe Biden going to win white evangelicals? No. But if he can eat into that a little bit, it's really devastating for Trump. And especially, as you pointed out, with, you know, some of the court decisions mm -hmm. that just went against um, the, the conservative Christian yeah. base, in particular Gorsuch writing the majority opinion on LGBTQ equality, essentially calls into question the whole strategy of voting for people that you may find sort of personally questionable, like Donald Trump, just in order to get the courts. It's not working out. One of the things Gabby really well points out there is that in 08, Obama actually went hardcore after the evangelical vote and was mm. able to win much more of the percent that he did in 2008 than Hillary did in 2016. Part of that is because at the time, you know, he even he was against gay marriage and all of that. But I think that Biden has internalized some of that debate, and he's not as forward on the culture war issues as Hillary Clinton was. Hillary was much more outwardly leaning into these. I think they're actually substantively the same, but the way that people feel about whether you're going to be antithetical to their interests or not the brand personally, is different. The, per the brand is just fundamentally different. So one of the things David Brody at the Christian Broadcasting Network said in that story is that Trump actually needs to be at 81% or higher in order to win re-election, just because amongst white evangelicals voters who are going to come out for him and that if that number slips he thinks he's going to lose we're beginning to see some of those numbers slip i think it's dual i think it's both biden and i think it's some of the disappointment in the supreme court decision we don't know yet how that's going to shake out but i think but that take some of the wind out of the sails i yeah, think is no, what you would there's, say there's no question and then the the last thing here is also the fundraising which is that 
you know, you can look at fun, you can look at the enthusiasm, you can look at this, you can talk about hidden Trump voters, you know, that we put briefly up there on the screen. None of that seems to materialize. But this raw fundraising number is something the RNC and the Trump campaign always wanted to say. And as I brought here, it was a juggernaut. They, for the very first time, were topped by the DNC and Joe Biden in May fundraising. So I'm not, they weren't dramatically outspent. I think the Biden campaign raised 85 million and the Trump campaign raised 74. These are both with the DNC, the RNC. But having that number shows that one of the things that we would often talk here was about how Biden was you know, financially derelict. He basically had nothing. Um, he was a terrible fundraiser. He had zero cash on hand during the primary. Even then we were saying, man, he's got a lot of catching up to do. The RNC and the Trump campaign have $200 million in the bank. Now, because of so much of the against vote against Trump is animated, is that all of these people, a lot of that was even raised online. It wasn't just big money. So this is all there. I'm not saying it's Obama 2008 levels. Yeah. But having some peer, peer competition is not the expectation that was going into this campaign. Everybody expected that Trump was going to be able to outspend the Biden campaign by five to one. If it's just two to one or even 1.5 to one, that's not a good place to be. Biden's going to have plenty of money. Trump's going to have plenty of money. Um, money is not ultimately mm -hmm. going to be the thing. And I think it's at the presidential level in particular, and we saw this during the Democratic primary as well, m because there is so much national media attention and you are so impacted by the, nas the winds of the, the national domestic political environment, I don't think the money will ultimately be determinative. So why does this matter? Well, if you think about the talking points that the Trump that Trump has had over the course of last cycle and this cycle, there's like, oh, the, the poll numbers and the polls are amazing. Well, the polls are not amazing. There's like nothing you can pull out. Maybe you can pull out some cherry picked enthusiasm numbers to try to make yeah, your point there. But that's getting to be a yeah. little bit slim pickings there, right? There were the economic numbers. Okay, we can tell this amazing low unemployment and the stock market is amazing and GDP growth and whatever. Can't do that anymore. Um, then there's like, oh, the ra the enthusiasm of the rally crowds, which is like the visible manifestation of how the polls are wrong and we have the silent majority, et cetera. Can't tout that anymore. And so the last thing is like, well, we have this huge fundraising juggernaut. Not so much. Yeah. So every single one of these pieces where Trump could, you know, hold on to some talking point of his vast superiority over Joe Biden is essentially evaporating. Um, Biden's campaign spokesperson, Simone Sanders, was on with Chris Wallace yesterday. Um, he challenged her very aggressively on the campaign's strategy and especially on the fact that Biden hasn't really taken many questions from the press lately. Let's take a listen to that. Perhaps more important, he has not held a news conference, either in person or online, for 80 days, almost three months. Why not? Well, Chris, uh, to be clear, Vice President Biden takes, uh, does interviews, takes questions from the press regularly. And yes, in March, we were, we have adjusted to this new normal like most people in America. We have been campaigning virtually, but just because we are campaigning virtually does not mean we are not meeting uh, actual voters across the country. Vice President Biden has campaigned in Michigan and Florida. Uh, Dr. Biden has campaigned in uh, Colorado uh, and Texas. So the reality is what we have been doing is following CDC guidelines, Chris. What we have been but why doing hasn't he is held a news conference for 80, But why hasn't he held a news conference for 80 days? Chris, as many of you, uh, many of y'all in the, in the national press and in the Bellway press are well aware, we take pride in prioritizing uh, local media. And so the vice president is doing local media interviews. He's doing national uh, media interviews. And he is taking questions from reporters. The they real love answer. To say that. Well, yeah. the real answer is they're not taking questions because they don't have they don't to. Because they're up like twelve. Because they're yeah. up like twelve points. And why would you screw that up? The yeah. strategy is working perfectly well. This landscape could not have possibly benefited Joe Biden more. We know the Trump campaign is out there pushing for let's have more debates, mm -hmm. let's have four debates. I'm sure the Biden campaign's like, like let's have one. like one debate 1. 5. via yeah. Zoom with a <laughs> teleprompter, right? So she's smiling, she's happy. They don't need to take questions because this is working out perfectly yeah. fine for them. Probably the luckiest person who's run for president in a long time. So <laughs> I don't know. All right. we're gonna tell you what's on our radars. That's next.